On the morning of May 2nd, 1968, a 12-man Special Forces Reconnaissance Team was inserted by helicopters in a dense jungle area west of Loch Ninh, Vietnam, to gather intelligence information about confirmed large-scale enemy activity. This area was controlled and routinely patrolled by the North Vietnamese Army. After a short period of time on the ground, the team met heavy enemy resistance and requested emergency extraction. Three helicopters attempted extraction, but were unable to land due to intense enemy small arms and anti-aircraft fire. Sergeant Vietnavides was at the forward operating base in Loch Ninh monitoring the operation by radio when these helicopters returned to offload wounded crew members and to assess aircraft damage. Sergeant Benavides voluntarily boarded a returning aircraft to assist in another extraction attempt. Realizing that all the team members were either dead or wounded and unable to move to the pickup zone, he directed the aircraft to a nearby clearing where he jumped from the hovering helicopter and ran approximately 75 meters under withering small arms fire to the crippled team. Prior to reaching the team's position, he was wounded in his right leg, face, and head. Despite these painful injuries, he took charge, repositioning the team members and directing their fire to facilitate the landing of an extraction aircraft and the loading of wounded and dead team members. He then threw smoke canisters to direct the aircraft to the team's position. Despite his severe wounds and under intense enemy fire, he carried and dragged half of the wounded team members to the awaiting aircraft. He then provided protective fire by running alongside the aircraft as it moved to pick up the remaining team members. As the enemy's fire intensified, he hurried to recover the body and the classified documents on the dead team leader. When he reached the team leader's body, Sergeant Benavides was severely wounded by small arms fire in the abdomen and grenade fragments in his back. At nearly the same moment, the aircraft pilot was mortally wounded and his helicopter crashed. Although in extremely critical condition due to his multiple wounds, Sergeant Benavides secured the classified documents and made his way back to the wreckage where he aided the wounded out of the overturned aircraft and gathered the stunned survivors into a defensive perimeter. Under increasing enemy automatic weapons and grenade fire, he moved around the perimeter distributing water and ammunition to his weary men, reinstilling in them a will to live and fight. Facing a buildup of enemy opposition with a beleaguered team, Sergeant Benavides mustered his strength and began calling in tactical airstrikes and directing the fire from supporting gunships to suppress the enemy's fire and so permit another extraction attempt. He was wounded again in his thigh by small arms fire while administering first aid to a wounded team member just before another extraction helicopter was able to land. His indomitable spirit kept him going as he began to carry his comrades to the craft. On his second trip with the wounded, he was clubbed from behind by an enemy soldier. In the ensuing hand-to-hand -hand combat, he sustained additional wounds to his head and arms before killing his adversary. He then continued under devastating fire to carry the wounded to the helicopter. Upon reaching the aircraft, he spotted and killed two enemy soldiers who were rushing the craft from an angle that prevented the aircraft door gunner from firing upon them. With little strength remaining, he made one last trip to the perimeter to ensure that all classified material had been collected or destroyed and to bring in the remaining wounded. Only then, in serious condition from numerous wounds and loss of blood, did he allow himself to be pulled into the extraction aircraft. Sergeant Benavides' gallant choice to join voluntarily his comrades who were in critical straits, to expose himself constantly to withering enemy fire, and his refusal to be stopped despite numerous severe wounds saved the lives of at least eight men. His fearless personal leadership, tenacious devotion to duty, and extremely valorous actions in the face of overwhelming odds were in keeping with the finest traditions of the military service and reflect the utmost credit on him and the United States Army. Sergeant Benedictus, a nation grateful to you and to all your comrades, living and dead, awards you its highest symbol of gratitude. For service above and beyond the call of duty, the Congressional Medal of Honor.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, like you say in Spanish, in German, danke schön, Japanese, arigato ne, and in French, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I don't speak those languages fluently, but I'll never get lost in those countries if I ever go there. Thank you very much to the Million Dollar Roundtable for inviting me to come and be along with these other eloquent speakers. I come from a little town named Quero, Texas. I was born there, in the Turkey capital of the world. After the death of my mother and father, at an early age, my brother and I were adopted by an aunt and uncle. We moved to El Campo, Texas, a town southwest of Houston, by an hour and a half. I was raised there. I went to school there. I worked at our jobs there, shined shoes, sold papers pay cotton. And like a fool, I dropped out of school and I ran away from home. I'm not proud of that. I needed to learn the skill. I needed an education. My adopted father would tell me, son, an education and a diploma is the key to success. Bad habits and bad company will ruin you. Well, I was too old to go back to school. I didn't want to returned back, so I joined the Texas National Guard, and I liked what I saw in men in uniform. And I qualified to join the regular army. I needed that education and learned the skill. So I was accepted into the regular army, and I heard about the airborne. I heard about that extra pay that you get for jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> so I qualified to go to jump school at Fort Bend, Georgia. But the Dern recruiters never told me what the training was like. For every mistake that you make, you do push-ups. And I can honestly tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm one of the guys that helped put Georgia into South Carolina doing push-ups. <laughs> well, I finished my training. I got assigned to a well-known unit at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the 82nd Airborne Division. I like the 82nd, thank you. Airborne all the way. I like that. And so, after a while there, I heard about the Special Forces. You know it as the Green Berets. And they were coming up, so I qualified to join the Special Forces. Of course, I'm a linguist. We and the Special Forces are trained to operate deep behind enemy lines with little or no support at all. We are trained in five specialties. I'm trained in three. Operation Intelligence, where I learned oceanography, meteorology, photography. I'm an interrogator and I'm a linguist. I'm trained in light and heavy weapons and cross trains I've been all over the world, the Far East, Europe, South and Central America, and two tours in Vietnam. I was assigned to Berlin, Germany. And I was declared one time that I was the only Hispanic American that could speak German with a southern accent. <laughs> Feeling danke, danke, sir. So I came back and retrained at Fort Bragg. And Vietnam was brewing up. In 1965, I was sent to Vietnam as an advisor to a Vietnamese infantry unit. After a short period of time there, I stepped on the mine. I woke up in the Philippine Islands in Clark Air Force Base. I was paralyzed from the waist down. I was declared never to walk again. I was transferred to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, Beach Pavilion. The doctors were initiating my medical discharge papers. But at night, I would slip out of bed and crawl to a wall, using my elbows and my chin. My back would just be killing me, I'd be crying. But I'd get to the wall, and I'd set myself against the wall and I backed myself up against the wall and I'd stand there like Elijah the Indian. I'd stand there and move my toes right and left, right. Every single chance I got a, 
I got. I wanted to walk. I wanted to go back to Vietnam because of what the news media was saying about us, that our president was not needed there to burn the flag and what. And I saw a lot of other patients coming back, limbs missing. I wanted to go back. I was determined because I remember when I was taught in jump school, that old master sergeant would tell me, Benavides, quitters never win and winners never quit. What are you? I'm a winner. And I remember in my special voice. And I remember my special forces training. One of the training missions that I was on, I remember that my leader would tell me, faith, determination, and a positive attitude. A positive attitude will carry you further than ability. You can do it, Benavides. You can do it. I never forgot those three words. Never. So there I was at night. Slip out of bed. The nurses would catch me sometimes. They would chew me out, give me a pill, sleep in pill, put me to sleep. They would tell the doctors in the morning. I was determined to walk. Nine months later, here comes my medical discharge paper. And I told the doctor, Doctor, look what I can do. He said, Sergeant, I'm sorry. Even if you can stand up, you'll never be able to walk. I jumped out of bed and I stood up right before him. My back was hurting, aching. I was crying. And I moved just a little bit. The doctor said, Benavides, if you walk out of this room, I'll tear the papers up. I walked out of that ward at Beach Pavilion. I walked out with a limp. I went back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I started my therapy again, running five or ten miles a day, doing 50, 100 push-ups. And I made three parachute jumps in one day. I was ready to go back to Vietnam, physically and mentally ready to go back. My orders were to go to Central America as an advisor. But being a non-commissioned officer and knowing some of the good officers in the right places, my orders were diverted. So, so, so I went back to Vietnam in 1968. The latter part of April, I was inserted, my buddy and I, to gather intelligence information behind enemy lines. And after two days on the ground, my buddy was shot through the eye, the back, and the legs. Our mission was completed, but I didn't want to leave my buddy behind. I called in for an extraction helicopter to come and get us out. They came in with the McGuire rig. McGuire rig is nothing but a piece of rope, nylon rope with a hook. In that case, there was two ropes. We hooked on, the enemy was firing at us. We pulled up, going up through the canopy of the jungle. Our rope started to twist and rub. You know, nylon, it burns when it rubs. As we cleared the canopy, our ropes were completely twisted and rubbing. And there was a non-commissioned officer that looked out of the helicopter, he was riding as a safety man. And when he saw those two ropes burning, he immediately tied himself with a piece of rope around his waist, and he pulled himself out of the helicopter and undid those two ropes, separated them. That's dedication. That's love of fellow men and country. I'll never forget that man. And the enemy was still firing at us, but they never shot us. We landed. We landed in a safe spot. My buddy was taken to the hospital shortly thereafter. He expired. I was in another staging area, waiting for our next assignment. When I heard on the radio something like a popcorn machine, then I heard a voice: "Get us out of here! Get us out of here! Come in and get us out quick, ASAP!" I asked the radio operator, "Who are those?" He said, "I don't know. They haven't gave us any call sign." And I saw some helicopter pilots run to the flight line, scrambling. I ran right behind them. We saw a helicopter coming in, to land, and had a door gunner slumped over his weapon. When the helicopter landed, I unstrapped the door gunner, Michael Craig, 19 years old. 
We just celebrated his 19th birthday in March. I cradled him in my arms, and his last words were, My God, my mother and father. I asked the pilot, Who are the people on the ground? He said, Hey, he said, That's that black NCO, that non-commissioned officer saved your life the other day, remember? I said, Leroy Wright. Leroy always got, always got picked for top secret assignments, him and Musso and O'Connor. So it was an instant reaction. I saw a bag of medical supplies, I picked it up, went over to my helicopter, got on the helicopter. We got on with the forward air controller, the guy that's in, he said, You can't go in there, you can't go in. It's too hot. Little did I know that I was going to spend six hours in hell. You heard what the president read the citation of how I earned the Medal of Honor. But he didn't tell you of what I went through when I in, engaged in the hand-to-hand -hand combat. I was hitting the mouth with the butt of the weapon. My jaws were locked. After my last return back to the helicopter, when I was boarded on, I was holding my intestines in my hand. We lifted up. The helicopter had over its payload. Blood was flowing on both sides of the helicopter. When we landed, it locked me in our staging area. And it started unloading. It started identifying the bodies. They found out I loaded three dead enemy soldiers in that helicopter. I didn't want to leave anybody behind. My mission, my mission was to recover the classified material, so if anybody had it, not, uh, he was on a helicopter. <laughs> so they let, they let the three enemy soldiers on the side, and because I sort of look oriental, they thought I was one of them, so they let me lay right next to them. And they were putting us in body bags. And I remember that my feet had been lifted and I was inserted into the body bag and I could hear that zipper coming up and I thought, oh my God, no, no. My eyes were shut because I had blood all over my face and, my eyes, and the blood had dried up in my eyelids. And I couldn't talk because my jaws were locked and I could hear that zipper coming up, coming up. And one of my buddies was doing the Mexican head dance and he was yelling at the doctor, that's Roy, that's Roy Benavides. The doctor said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for him. Oh my God, and the zipper just, just, just coming up. I was trying to wiggle in my own blood. And finally, I'll find out later, Jerry Cottenham made that doctor at least to feel my heartbeat. When I felt that hand on my chest, I made the luckiest shot I ever made in my life. I spit in the doctor's face. <laughs> So the doctor said, I think he'll make it. He'll... <laughs> so I, uh, I was uh, cleaned up, put in a helicopter, alongside with my buddy, one of the guys that I had saved. We got airborne, and I just said to myself, hold on, buddy, just hold on. We're going to get some medical attention. And his grip tightened up on me. And then he let go. I said, oh, God, why do you put me through this test? Why? You helped me get these men out, save them, save this material, and now you take them away from me. Why? And I was crying, I was moving so much, at the co-pilot, he happened to look back, and he thought that I was gasping for air, so he gets out of his seat, get his bayonet out, and he's going to do a track on me, and I'm about to kick him out of the helicopter. <laughs> That's just too much for one day. So I, we landed in the hospital at, at uh, Long Bend. And I was wheeled to the operating room. And as I was being lifted to my operating table, I saw this nurse on her hands and knees crying, yelling, asking God, 
Why do you do this to these men? Why? Just crying. And as I turned a little bit to my left, I saw on the other operating table a man that had both legs and both arms missing. I passed out. I woke up in the ward. One of my buddies was laying next to me. We were so bandaged up, we couldn't talk. We used to wiggle our toes to make sure that we were still alive. After a short while, my buddy was transferred from there and I thought he had died. I was transferred to Japan, Tachikawa. In the airplane that I was flying in Matavak, we lost two men. And I remember this nurse kept yelling at me. Benavides, you're not going to die on me. I'm going to pinch you every time you close your eyes. I'm going to pinch you. I'm going to pinch you. Boy, she kept pinching me. When I got to Tachikawa, when I got to Japan, and they wheeled me into the operating room, they just drove me again. I remember the doctor. I heard him say, what in the world happened to you? I had blue spots, red spots all over me. And I said, that lady kept pinching me up there. <laughs> So after, I went back to Fort Sam Houston, the Beach Pavilion. And I stayed in that hospital almost a year. I continued with my career. And then I was awarded with a medal. I was dedicating myself to come and speak to schools, to civic groups, to help anyone that I can help. My life was spared for a reason. And I hope there's a good reason. A lot of people call me a hero. I appreciate the title. But the real heroes are the ones that gave their life for this country. The real heroes are our wives, our mothers. Above all, the heroes are the ones that are laying in those hospitals, disabled for life in those hospital beds. But the real heroes are the future leaders of our country, these students that are staying in school and learning to say no to drugs. Those are our real heroes. You know, there's a sin among us veterans for those that had fought for it, life has a special flavor the protected will never know. You have never lived till you almost died. And it is us veterans that pray for peace most of all, especially the wounded, because we have to suffer the wounds of war. I'm asked hundreds of times, would you do it over again? In my 25 years in the military, I feel like I've been overpaid for the service to my country. There'll never be enough paper to print the money, nor enough gold in Fort Knox for me to have to keep from doing what I did. I'm proud of being American, and even prouder And I'm even prouder that I've earned the privilege to wear the Green Beret. I live by the motto of duty, honor, country. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America.